So thanks uh, for putting your introductions in the chat. It's really nice to see uh, from where everybody is joining and uh, who you all are. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, I hope you are having a very good morning, and afternoon and evening. We have people from, from various continents. Um, and today we have come together to discuss with you and four brilliant speakers how we can unite and strengthen the climate justice and energy democracy movement. Um, you might be active even in both. Um, but before we dive into this conversation, let me run you through a bit of background and some practicalities. So this webinar is organized by Transnational Institute, TNI, which is an international activist research organization fighting for social, economic, environmental justice. Um, and we run these webinars with Friends of the Earth Europe. Uh, and uh, I'm Lavinia Steinfort, and uh, I do these webinars with Susie. Um, Susie, would you like to introduce yourself and Friends of the Earth Europe? Hey everybody, I'm Susie, uh, Friends of the Earth Europe, based in Brussels. I see some familiar faces, that's really great, and some faces I haven't seen for a while, so that's also great, and many new faces. Friends of the Earth International is the biggest uh, grassroots federation, and yeah, I'm uh, based in the European chapter and working mainly on climate issue, uh, climate justice, but also energy democracy um, issues. And I'm happy to guide you through with Lavinia through that uh, webinar. And we had so far, I think this morning, we had more than 130 registrations. So let's see how many uh, we will have today. And we try to make it as interactive as possible with the yeah, limited time, of course, we have. Lavinia. Great, thanks, Susie. Um, so just to say that these webinars are a feature of uh, the Energy Democracy Alliance, which started in 2016, 45 years ago. And next to these webinars, the Alliance consists of a mailing list and a website, uh, which you can find in the chat. Um, so by now, around 400 activists, trade unionists, campaigners and researchers from all over the world are on this list to exchange key developments and materials in order to advance a just transition toward energy democracy. Um, so this alliance is focused on how to democratize energy systems in participatory and equitable ways, um, meaning exploring how publicly owned in combination with community driven energy systems can and should put workers, communities, marginalized groups such as women, people of color and poor families, among many others first. Um, and finally, um, this alliance um, uh, works together to push back against state inaction, market forces and privatizations that continue to block futures that are powered by renewables and redistribution. Now, in terms of practicalities and uh, in order to hear from as many of you as possible, please for the moment mute yourself unless we give you the floor. Um, and we have a few moments for your input. So if you would like to ask a question or share anything at the end, um, in terms of updates, please raise your hand and or mention this in the chat. Um, and you're all very welcome to put on your camera. Uh, and it's great that many of you have this on. But please be aware that we will record this webinar and put it on YouTube so that we can share it um, with the Energy Democracy mailing list and everyone else who registered but couldn't make it. Um, now, let's talk uh, a little bit about movement building. As the climate catastrophe is unfolding very rapidly and more and more people are getting organized to demand climate justice and build energy democracies on the ground. So these movements sometimes but not always overlap, even though we have very much in common um, to turn the fight against corporate extractivist, uh, often colonial powers into just transition pathways towards pro-public energy systems that are democratic, socially just and regenerative. And we choose this framework because without generalizing or risking a debate about defining climate justice and energy democracy, we did notice that many climate activists are not often talking about the needed solutions. And the other way around, many energy democracy activists do not address the so much broader climate justice perspective beyond their own projects. Of course, we know also many Did we lose Lavinia? 
maybe I maybe I just take over. It's good we have two people. <laughs> Lavinia, when you're back, you're back. So I think Lavinia just wanted to give a bit of the context, right, why we are here, and so to really link uh, the climate justice uh, activist and also energy democracy activists today. And some of us are here in the room today. We know there are many more um, out there, but we wanted to give one of the spaces uh, to discuss that a bit more. And we also thought we really want to challenge uh, each other today a bit so that we on the one side kind of hear a bit where, because in the end, our aim is for all, we want to be impactful. We want to kill the fossil fuel industry. We want to get justice uh, around the world and much more. So therefore we want to bring yeah, different players together. And uh, maybe um, just to say that is also part of our kind of TNI and for Europe doing uh, this kind of uh, webinars on energy democracy issues and uh, usually we focus more on the energy topics but today we really thought it's actually time it's a good moment in time to bring and to talk more about um, different but also uh, yeah the same movements the climate justice and energy democracy movements Lavinia do you still want to add something I see you're back hi actually I didn't know when I was cut out <laughs> where did it stop <laughs> Maybe we can actually start um, uh, otherwise with the, the speakers. Yeah, great. So maybe I, I actually start. We do have four great speakers. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Asad, Lala, Marisol and Jaren. So from very different perspectives and very different parts of the country. So some people just woke up, it's still dark. Maybe some other people are going to bed soon, so also uh, bear or keep that in mind <laughs> for us today. The, probably most of us, like me, have the privilege of being in a good time zone today, so it's the early afternoon here. So if there's any also issue, do um, yeah, use the chat box. Jaron, let's start with you. I know it's super early at your time. Um, so Jaron, Jaron, you're the organizing director with Grassroots Global Justice, GGJ. Your national, uh, that's a national alliance of US-based grassroots organizing groups building an agenda for power for Black, Indigenous, Latins, Asian, Pacific Islander, and white working class communities, uh, specifically in North America. So we are great having you here. You have been building our GGGJ's um, Just Transition, Climate Justice and Anti-Militarism campaigns. And you were also recently a co-author of the report, We Are Mother Earth's Red Line, analyzing some of the impacts of the Paris Agreement. So with that, maybe I um, ask you, we asked the same question for the first round to, to everybody. Specifically, how can we build a stronger movement so for climate justice, but also end energy democracy and bring them together? So kind of what can we learn from each other and specifically also what challenges do we actually experience and have to or are already uh, anticipating. And I know you're also working specifically um, with the communities on the ground. So maybe you could start and share a bit your experiences and what I say also do challenge us. Um, it's a safe space to do that. Welcome, Jaron. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Susie. Thank you um, for all the organizers, for TNI, for Friends of the Earth International. Um, I, it's a huge honor for me to be here because I know this is such a critical time um, in uh, the world, in the moment that we're in, the political moment we're in, and also in the articulation that we're trying to build together as movements. And, and I think we're coming out of such an incredibly intense year of a lot of suffering, a lot of personal pain that has touched everyone in the globe around this pandemic and the crisis that we've been in. It's also had an impact on the shared spaces that we get to be in around sort of the movement building alignment work. And that's often where, um, you know, I get the honor to, to be a part of that work in our movements in North America because I'm part of Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and part of our um, existence, part of why our, our members have built this us as an alliance is to be in strong relationship in the question of internationalism and our shared struggle together because we already know that especially on the climate movement, we are so deeply interwoven with each other and particularly um, being in for us in the belly of the beast and you know inside located inside the United States, which is such a you know a, a, an imperialist uh, force that impacts conditions 
particularly in the global south, but we know that our struggles are also deeply linked in terms of the struggles in Europe and the struggles in North America. So it's very good to be in shared space with you all as we move toward COP26 and need to align around what we can do to pressure in the right direction. And I'm grateful for this theme today around the dynamics of energy democracy, of the questions of energy and the questions of climate justice. Um, for us, we've seen this you know, really deeply interwoven in our movements. Um, so again, as Susie said, our movement and GGJ, our, our alliance is built by very locally rooted uh, frontline communities. And when we talk about frontline communities, um, it's communities that are impacted directly by the extractive, um, you know, energy system, by the, by the, the um, you know, refineries. We have uh, many refinery impacted communities in California and Wilmington, we're processing the tar sands from Canada. Uh, we're processing the oil extracted from, from um, the Amazon. We're, we also have oil drilling literally happening in the backyards of communities in Wilmington. Um, we have fracking happening across North America. We have fracking impacted communities in North Dakota. We have obviously coal impacted communities, similar, very similar to many of the conditions I'm sure folks will speak to here today. For us um, in the Appalachian area, where there's been mountaintop removal, where workers have been impacted by black lung, even as the coal uh, industry has been in massive decline and declaring bankruptcy, they have left massive amounts of land and water, you know, completely destroyed, a tremendous toxic legacy. And we also have a huge number of, of communities impacted by incineration, um, communities like Ironbound, um, like Detroit, Flint, Michigan. And all of these impacted peoples have been in a direct struggle. And I, I'm speaking to, to those dominant um, models of energy um, in our system here, but also need to lift up that we ha also have many communities that are impacted by the tremendous uh, devastation of uranium mining in the nuclear industry, um, particularly the indigenous peoples, the Pueblo and Diné peoples in the Southwest. And we also have dam impacted peoples. Um, and so when we talk about energy, the question isn't only these questions of what material are we using and what, dev, you know, what's, what impact are they having on greenhouse gases, on the burning of the planet, on the contamination of land, air, water on, uh, you know, on life itself, on the, you know, con communities um, impacted. But we also, as many of you are talking about the model of the energy itself, the question of the exploitation of the workers, the question of the exploitation of consumers. And the thing I would lift up as we start this conversation today, because I'm coming from, from North American context, is the crisis that many, that I don't know if it reached the, the global networks, but the crisis that was witnessed here in Texas, Oklahoma, um, Arkansas in this last week where there was this massive polar vortex, right? Which is so clearly linked to what's happening with global warming that we saw then the impact of freezing, freezing conditions, historic, unprecedented, conditions that uh, the infrastructure was not set up for, and it had a devastating impact on all of the peoples, but in particular on Black, Indigenous, Latinx, working class communities um, in, uh, in each of this region. But what we saw specifically in Texas and across the region, three to four million people lost their power. Three to four million people in those freezing conditions. And that became a life threatening, extremely dangerous situation for people it lasted many days. But then even beyond that also, um, because of the, you know, um, the infrastructure not being set up and, and being heavily privatized, also millions of people have lost access to clean and healthy water because their pipes have burst. And so in that we see the, the interwoven aspects of the system that in that crisis, it's not only about a heavily fossil fuel uh, grid that failed, but it's also about a heavily privatized system that has put the profit of those industries above the well-being of people. And we see that the fundamental human right to energy, to water, it was ruptured at great expense to communities. So um, the, the note I'll end on around what our movements need to do for us we've been in a really important movement 
uh, construction process um, that we were we have been brought into by the movement of people affected by dams in Brazil. And that's where we see the strongest power and collective hope. That's where we see who holds the future in their hands. Um, and they've been building a process and articulation called the movement of people affected by dams across the Americas region. Um, it includes um, the Consejo de Pueblo Maya in Guatemala, Molatima in Chile, Copín in Honduras, um, the MLK Center in Cuba, uh, movements in Panama and Venezuela. They've invited us into this process also being in our context in North America. And I know that they're in a process of construction and reaching out to other movements around the world. And the question they're asking is, what is the model of energy that our popular movements can demand? And they put forward the ideas of, we need an energy model that first and foremost respects sovereignty, that we need to have the control of peoples, that the energy, we need to see energy as a common good, and it needs to be brought back into public control as a, as a well-being, as a right of public control. And they talk about this question of popular control, because we also need to look at specific communities having, you know, access to control their own energy system, even also at a local level, under that public control, that we need to look at, um, you know, not massive solar grids or solar farms or solar, you know, the same, not replacing renewable energy with the same model of privatization um, and, and control by the largest, some of the largest transnational corporations in the world. Lastly, they also talk about the idea of shared wealth and the idea that this, this is something that should be a human right that needs to be protected for all. And then our movements would, would also add in the centrality of the question of an energy system that is in right relationship with nature and right relationship with Earth, with Earth systems, which is, I think is the question that's being asked here today about where the climate movement uh, intersects here and where the, the, the leadership of indigenous peoples and impacted peoples can help us build the demand and a vision of a popular energetic model that can meet the crisis we're in today. I'm going to pass it forward to the other folks, but I really look forward to coming back around the question of COP26 because we do see that um, we are battling the far right on this question and we're also battling the neoliberals. And so we need to be in alignment as we move forward around how we challenge on both those fronts um, to, to meet the moment in the way we need to. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jaren. That was amazing. Yeah, great how you uh, weaved everything together from sharing the struggle in Texas to the movement um, of uh, people affected by dams. Um, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's now uh, move over to Lala Peñaranda and briefly introduce you. So Lala is um, yeah Lala is a feminist activist from Colombia um, and the Latin America coordinator for Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, also known as TUED. She worked with the agrarian movement Marcha Patriotista, if I pronounce that uh, close to uh, how it should be, in southern Colombia before focusing on movement demands for energy democracy. She is also co-founder of the organizing project Internationalism from Below. Um, so uh, first, it would be great to hear uh, your insights on what we can learn from each other and, um, and how we can kind of overcome the challenges to become a stronger movement, uniting climate justice and energy democracy. But more, also more specifically, it would be great to hear about um, the approach of trade unions for energy democracy um, and the concrete struggle, trade union struggle that uh, you are part of in Colombia. Thank you. Over to you, Lala. All right. Thank you, um, everybody, for creating this space. I think it's a really important framing that you've provided for us. So I'll introduce myself briefly. My name is Lala. Um, I included that part about the agrarian unions in the intro because I think that's where um, a lot of sort of Colombia's militant history comes from, but also just where my own political process began. Uh, I'll get into the details of the Latin American and Colombian context shortly, but Colombia is, um, has been for a long time, the third largest recipient of military aid um, of the United States in the world. And, the sort of state violence that is seen against environmental activists, against trade unionists, is something that has to be confronted within the conversation of energy democracy and a just transition. Um, and agrarian unions have been sort of at the forefront of bearing that 
mm, that that weight, that historic weight of state violence. Um, so I think from my perspective and the perspective of trade unions for energy democracy, um, you know, in Latin America, we see a region that is characterized um, by, at least the left is characterized by sort of um, radical resource nationalism on the one hand. Um, so, you know, this promotion of we need to use the region's natural wealth, the resources, the mining, the oil, the carbon, um, to address historic levels of, or sorry, the, the historic legacy of colonialism, um, i.e. inequality, uh, oppression. So we need to use these this natural wealth to uh, distribute, to fund education, health with a leftist agenda. And that was sort of one of the left arguments that characterized the pink tide governments. And on the other hand, although my argument is that we don't have to counterpose these, mm, this analysis, we see a sort of uh, environmentally rooted movement that prioritizes or centralizes territorial autonomy, anti-extractivist struggles, um, racial justice, and, um, and I think uh, assemblies, uh, energy democracy really. And so the argument I think that, um, that we make from trade unions for energy democracy is that unions, especially when in coalition with social movements in the region are positioned strategically to sort of address demands from both of these uh, lefts, right? So one of the questions is, um, how do trade unions just transition demands relate to calls for commonizing the state? Again, going back to this idea that the state has historically been such a violent agent. Um, how do we sort of wed those demands of energy transition, energy democracy with a commonizing, a democratizing of the state and also just of, of community, of livelihoods, of um, what it means to live in a dignified way in our territories. Um, so Trade Unions for Energy Democracy in Latin America has approximately 15 unions. Um, the project started actually mm, partially influenced by the social forum. Um, and so in some ways it has, it dates back to the struggles against the privatization of water in Latin America. Um, but I would say some of the main unions, just to name a few, are CUT Brasil, um, FENTAP of Peru, which are the water workers, um, Frente Unitario Trabajadores of Chile, which works mainly with mining, um, and, the, and also the call centers. So getting into sort of the, some of the, the feminist demands and gender dynamics of the labor movement. Um, in Colombia, we have uh, the carbon, oil, mining, education, uh, unions, electricity, um, and it's a pretty it's a pretty rich dynamic when we when we're all in the room, um, tossing ideas and projects and campaigns, um, and unfortunately, as I as I mentioned, often um, you know in our conversations, what comes up is again the the state violence that a lot of these trade unionists are are fighting against, um, and often in in the in the framework of um, energy democracy and fighting privatization of oil or carbon or whatever it may be. Um, and, okay, so I'll try to keep this very brief. Um, TUED is a, so Trade Unions for Energy Democracy um, is a global network of about 70 unions um, from about 25 countries roughly. And what drew me to TUED originally was the argument that speaks to the approach of Trade Unions for Energy Democracy at large um, is that we have to create a, uh, an alternative to a social dialogue approach. So rather than working with um, sort of, you know, the industry uh, interests or the business interests or, um, you know, treating one another as sort of equals in a negotiating table, like um, uh, that treats, you know, the private sector as, as, a, as a partner, we have to confront the uh, and well, we have to confront that logic 
um, which is inherently sort of capitalist because it invisibilizes the, the class forces at play um, and, and create a sort of counter proposal of social power. So how do we as uh, trade unions address worker focused concerns while, this is really important, advancing deeper socioeconomic transformation. So that's sort of what can be summarized as the social power approach. And it's an approach that, of course, has just transition at its center um, and that argues for a deep restructuring of the global political economy. Um, it argues that existing power and ownership relations, critically ownership relations, um, must be challenged and changed. And that a just transition sort of cannot advance without that. So to get into Latin America, um, don't have much time, but according to the International Business and Human Rights Resource Center, um, more than 50% of reported conflicts surrounding renewable energy projects in the past decade have been in Central and South America. Um, in Latin America, more than a quarter of primary energy comes from renewables, which is twice the global average. And hydropower has played a historic role sort of in the region, although we know that that's not necessarily socially or environmentally sustainable and has to be challenged. Um, I think I'll get into some of the details later, but I just want to end on a note of Colombia. Um, so Colombia, again, the hydropower accounts for about 70% of electricity generation, and I'll end on this point. But importantly, Colombia, as many other countries in the global south, has been based on an extractivist economic model. So this poses challenges inherently. On the one hand, we don't consume as much energy as other countries, but on the other hand, our entire economic model from the dawn of colonization has been based on extractivism. So addressing uh, an energy transition isn't just, it is of course about deep growth, but it is also about getting at the heart of what has, of how our societies have been structured from, again, from colonization. So there's lots of important and interesting examples that the Colombian trade union movement has given us. Um, and I'll just recommend that folks look into the oil workers of Colombia specifically, but also Sintra Carbon, the carbon workers. And again, I can get into more details later, but I'll leave it there for now. Thanks so much, Lala. Uh, great that you've touched upon uh, the importance of colonizing the state uh, in order to have a democratic and socially power transition. And um, uh, also to say to um, everyone else that is there, we are working with Lala to, to um, feature a case study on um, the struggle uh, and the broad coalition in Colombia um, by trade unions and social movements um, uh, to have energy democracy um, across the territory. So we're very excited about that. Um, and now we move to a, a different context, but um, still relating to yeah, the international political economy. Um, so first, uh, now we will hear from Marisol Reingel. Um, she's a social justice organizer and researcher based in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Currently, she's working on the Shell Must Fall campaign, as well as the Future Beyond Shell research, um, collaborating with uh, SOMO um, Foundation to uh, examine the power of multinationals, Transnational Institute and Code Road. Both projects aspire to contribute to a just recovery by mapping out strategic pathways to dismantle uh, the Dutch-British carbon major and to promote systemic change. Um, so Marisol, uh, please do share your insights on how to build stronger joint movement um, and specifically more about the future beyond shale campaign um, and why uh, a democratic energy has no place for multinationals like Shell. Um, so yeah, over to you, uh, Marisol. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you so much uh, as well for inviting me. Uh, I'm super excited to be here and together with these other fantastic uh, speakers. And I'm also looking forward later uh, to hopefully have an engaging discussions after our pitches are, are done. Um, yeah, let me briefly introduce myself as well. Uh, yeah, like Lavinia said, my name is uh, Marisol. I'm a social justice organizer who so far has mainly been active in the environmental justice movement in the Netherlands, Germany and the UK. 
uh, for a couple of years now, I've been involved with the direct action group Code Road based in the Netherlands that similar, for instance, to uh, Ende Gelände in Germany has been organizing mass uh, civil, dis civil disobedience actions against the fossil fuel industry. Um, addressing the first question about how we build a stronger movement for climate justice and energy democracy, I believe a key issue in sort of the Western European uh, climate movement really has been about how do we radicalize the discourse around climate disruption to increasingly embedded in a critique against the colonial capitalist system? And how, based on this analysis, analysis do we mobilize and build political and social consensus around solutions? Um, in an effort to strive towards such a shift, um, we, uh, as Code Road, together with other grassroots, we formed a coalition to launch uh, the Shermas for campaign in 2018 with a basic demand uh, to dismantle the carbon major World Dutch Shell in order to build a decentralized and socialized energy democracy. Uh, we developed this campaign on the backdrop of like emerging ideas around the Green New Deal at that time, and sort of in the hope of advancing the public discourse in the Netherlands and wider Central Europe from, um, uh, as it was addressed before, sort of the simple, idea from we need to phase out fossil fuels to really uh, like focus more on the questions, who are the key drivers of climate disruption? How do we hold them accountable? And how can they like, and how can they have a role in a just transition, knowing that for instance, the top uh, 20 oil and gas companies have contributed to 35% uh, of all carbon emissions worldwide. Uh, and that their business models to this date are um, sort of locked in like profit maximization uh, logic. Um, next to that, indeed, we have started uh, a research collaboration called Future Beyond Shell together with the Dutch think tanks, uh, as Lavinia um, noted, uh, said before, SOMA and TNI, with the aim to identify and discuss uh, legal, political, but also economic tools uh, ranging from more radical, uh, like uh, on how to radically and responsibly uh, restructure Shell. Uh, and uh, we do this in a hope to really map out new pressure points, new fields of interventions uh, against the oil and gas industry in order to inform movement strategies, uh, but also to facilitate action uh, in the upcoming months. Um, in terms of what challenges uh, we experience uh, and need to anticipate, I think, uh, I really do believe that this is a crucial time where uh, like these more radical ideas about system change uh, and addressing really the energy, uh, the general and model how we generate energy uh, uh, like is there. With the onset uh, of the corona pandemic, uh, I think we have entered a, a crisis that is so widely recognized as such um, that there's yeah opportunity to really spread these more radical ideas. Um, but I think, and as well, there is uh, I think the COVID pandemic really showed us how an uncontrol uncontrolled unraveling of the oil and gas sector has disastrous impacts, particularly on communities at the front lines as well as workers. Uh, in 2020 alone. Uh, Shell has cut 9,000 jobs in the context of its large uh, restructuring program. Um, also, what we witness is that similar to the financial crisis in 2008, uh, is that uh, the only action with which government governments seem to be able to respond to these massive shocks is by bailing out an industry that is factually doomed to die, uh, thereby sort of failing uh, to effectively create incentives for these big carbon majors to become key players in remodeling our energy sector so that it is fit for the future. Um, I think this is one of the biggest threats that we are facing at the moment that uh, we are not, I think this, this is the moment where uh, radical ideas can um, gain traction, but I think at least in the Netherlands or in, in Europe, we haven't effectively built yet a tool set uh, 
and like have a strong enough movement to really push for these radical ideas. Uh, I think there's also a great threat um, of co-option of progressive ideas as uh, carbon majors at this very moment are uh, really adapting themselves, reinventing the images, uh, greenwashing um, as they see that they're in a crisis. Um, I think also the urgency uh, of the crisis and the time pressure uh, to come up with alternative solutions uh, to forward the just transition um, is really like about how do we imagine pathways and build broader social and political consensus to bring about these changes by centering the voices that systematically have been excluded in these negotiations, uh, negotiations for decades. And I'm, uh, I think the, one of the biggest challenges for the movements will be uh, in Europe to not fall into the same traps that we've been falling into uh, for a long time. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I see last minute, but uh, I think maybe at this point, uh, yeah, um, this is it. <laughs> I'm wrapping up. Thank you very much, Marie. So you will also have more time to maybe elaborate some of the things um, later. Yeah. So everybody stay with us. Before we give the floor to, to some of you who want, uh, just a reminder, do put a question in the chat box if you want, but you will also have the possibility to say it yourself. But let's come to, the, um, to our fourth speaker, Asad, Asad Rehman, a longtime friend and comrade. So welcome, uh, welcome Asad. We, uh, so Asad, you're the executive director of the Radical Anti-Poverty and Social Justice Charity One Want. Before you also worked uh, with my organization, Friends of the Earth, for quite a while. And uh, Asad is, a, is also a leading climate justice activist whose work has really helped to reframe on the one side the climate crisis as a crisis of neoliberal capitalism, inequality and racism. And over the past uh, 35 years, you have been working with many different social movements. On the one side, you re really at the global level, so you have a lot of insight on that, but also uh, nationally and uh, locally uh, working with the people on the ground and with different movements, the anti-racist movement, the uh, uh, anti-globalization movement, the anti-war movement, and uh, others. So for you, it's a, it's a similar or the same question. And um, how can we really build the stronger movement for climate justice and energy democracy and kind of gain uh, from our strength and impact? And maybe you can share with your own experiences or your yeah, insights what we can learn from each other to build really a stronger movement that we saw and that we heard from the other speakers already that is really necessary because the evil is still out there. And uh, how can we unite the struggles for climate justice and uh, energy democracy? So maybe you, for you the same, you also have about seven minutes and then we come to uh, the participants. Welcome Asad. Thank you, Susie, and thank you, comrades. So lovely to see so many of you, uh, friends and comrades, and <clears throat> always a pleasure to be on any call with Joran and Marisol and, and uh, Lala. Uh, I won't repeat, and I totally agree with all of the perspectives that they shared. I, I just thought, when I was thinking about this, I, I just cast my mind back, you know, many of us were in Copenhagen. Do you remember when we were in Copenhagen and, you know, we had, we had part of our movement you know, under the banner of system change, not climate change. And then uh, uh, what I would call mainstream environmental movements, you know, talking about climate action. And uh, it feels like a, such a long time ago, um, but I think it's interesting partly for us to recognize what victories we've had, but also what mistakes we've made. So uh, it, is an ever, it is an absolute victory of the movement that now justice is such a central part of of everybody's discourse, right? Whether they believe it or not, but it is a very, very central part of, of, of justice. And we can say that at least, you know, we've shifted the, the frame to recognize the issue about urgency, the issue about ambition, the issue about impacts on the global south, and we've successfully at least made more of the mainstream recognize that tackling climate is only going to be possible if you can build a social license by also addressing economic inequality and other injustices. And, and I think we should, you know, recognize that's been a huge achievement from this, from this movement. But 
in Copenhagen, you know, as we, many of us left shattered, you know, there were large parts of our movement that said, we can only fight this at a local level. We're going back and we're fighting at local solutions and we're going to transform our system bit by bit and fought on, whether it was site battles against extractivism or site battles in terms of around pop on demand, around energy democracy, etc. cetera. And, and, and I think that was right that we did do that, right? And that we had this recognition that, you know, uh, the days of talking about climate change, about white polar bears and white icebergs or people only underwater has long gone, that we needed to talk about and address the fundamental question about energy poverty in the global north and talk about, you know, warm homes and people's own energy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that has been a real step forward. And of course, in the climate justice movement, we finally managed to shift a lot of people from just simply saying no to fossil fuels to start getting them to say, so what is the solution, right? And, and of course, some people said the solution is just renewable energy. Some of us said, no, the, it, it, the solution is people's owned energy. And that again, really, really great. But I, I wonder whether, you know, uh, what we've managed to do in terms of our two parts of our movement, which are clearly overlapping, but there is also parts of our movement that aren't connected together, right? That don't uh, 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 make that automatic identification. So when I look, for example, at large parts, particularly in the global north of the new climate justice movements, particularly younger movements, particularly, you know, which are all incredible and it's great to see that they see, you know, climate as colonialism and they've got these really, really big frames and they're making really big demands, but they don't have the policy then pathways as to how do you realize those demands? What is the demands that you make without then reproducing other, the mistakes that many of us have worked through in many, many years in terms of in terms of our movement. And we know that, for example, around renewable energy. And maybe, uh, Susie, there is a third part of our movement that should be part of this conversation, and again overlaps, which is the anti-extractivist movement, right? Because, you know, whilst many of us in, particularly I think in the global north, have talked about, um, well, the, the idea, the, the main fight is about wrestling control about distribution and generation from you know, private corporations, uh, we, there wasn't enough sufficient conversation about what about extraction, right? Who controls extraction? How is that done fairly? How much energy should we be using? You know, is it right that the, the global north continues to consume the same level of energy and energy use? And it, even if it's workers owned or people's owned or community owned. So that kind of, the conversation about limits I think was largely missing in that conversation. And it's something I think that, that our movements coming together can really bring to the fore, right? So we all know, you know, we're about 79 billion tons of material uh, extraction each and every year. OECD says we're about to go into about 167 billion tons in the coming decades. We all seen the figures that, you know, we're talking about such a massive increase in mi in mineral extraction of green mit minerals and metals, um, not just of cobalt and lithium, etc., but also, of course, of iron and copper. And we can see the scale of the devastation that is happening. And and uh, uh, as as Mary Sol said, this incredible greenwashing that is also taking place amongst corporations. Uh, I, before the COVID pandemic, you know, we were at Rio Tinto with communities from Chile and 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 uh, and, and 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 other places, and it was really fascinating to hear that the response of the of the CEO of Rio Tinto to all of these communities critiquing the environmental injustices that were being created was saying, "But we are needed for the green transition, right? That's who we are. We are critical actors in the green transition," and. I think it really brought this conversation together about how, you know, we have not successfully made each of our jigsaw pieces add together, right? So the conversations, for example, in the Global North about the Green New Deals, great. So many of us support them. And of course, they're a huge step forward, but all of them largely absence any question about material use, any question also about, you know, where and how do you fairly extract and who should extract how much energy, where should it come from? You know, uh, I think, you know, it was uh, Lala raised the, the point, you know, 
for many countries in the global south who have no other commodity to be exploited, you know, but but their fossil fuels. What do you say to them when you simply say no fossil fuels, right? Because the, if the one thing we've learned from the COVID pandemic has been that actually the global north is quite happily to turn its back on the majority of the world, even when, you know, no one is safe until everyone is safe is the logic that everybody buys into. You know, we saw that with both in the competition for PPE equipment. We see it, of course, in the rollout of the vaccine. We see it in the pricing of the vaccine. So I think there's a much more profound conversation that we need to have, which is, yes, we can win a frame. Yes, we can win demands. But have we moved to the point where we have got actual concrete policy pathways which lead us to the vision of the world that we all want to want to have and i don't think we've done enough work on that and this is where actually the energy democracy movement adds a lot of value to the climate justice movement because actually there there has been a lot more of a policy work like what are the blockages how do you what is the question about the state right the the, the are we looking to the state to deliver this if you don't look to the state let's say you have an either an ambivalent view or the state is the repressive agent. How, what does that mean then in terms of the energy transition uh, that we, is it simply good enough for us to be saying, well, the answer to energy poverty globally of three and a half billion people not having access to electricity or clean cooking is, is people's own energy and decentralized energy system. Like, how will that be enabled? Where is the resources going to come? What are the materials? Where is the finance going to come? I think we have not really done this piece of work sufficiently well enough. And I don't want to quit, quote Milton Friedman, the architect of neoliberalism, but uh, sometimes uh, the most uh, odd messenger also speaks truth. And I'm sure we've all heard, you know, his famous quote about, you know, it's only a crisis or a perceived crisis that creates profound change and um, and what's our job is to have like you know the, the policy uh, 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 p p p the policies lying there to make what is the impossible possible and i think there's still a gap in that bit of do we have the policies right and that's where i think both at the conversation of how do we do this at a global level to how do we do it at a regional level to how we do it at the national level is something we've still not answered and i i don't want to be a downer but when you look at the last century of crisis you know uh, we can say that in the global north there was a moment of massive transition and transformation that happened after in the 1930s yeah it took a defeat of fascism killing of millions of people but you got a new social compact and you had powerful social movements and the state talked about providing basic services to people health systems education social protection etc and that was partly a redistribution of the wealth between the elites to working people but at the expense of of course of the global south Look at the 1970s and we saw the victory of neoliberalism. Look at 2008 when we said that the global financial crisis would mean the end of capitalism. We saw a decade of austerity and a, and, and, and a strengthening of, of corporate elites. So I think there is a bigger, there's also a question which I really hope that we can collectively discuss, which is goes back to, are we building sufficient power and where is the right place to build power and who do we need to build power with to be able to make the policy pathways work for us. And I don't think at this point, we can honestly say either in the global north that we have built sufficient power for any of these policy positions to be you know, viable. Um, it is more likely, of course, that we're going to see the responses we're seeing, which is going to be saying, we're gonna have a green recovery in the global north. It will be on the basis of to inequitable access to energy it will be talking about with no limits on terms of material use and a wave of green a new green extraction legitimized and of course the domination of corporations within that and it's fascinating to look at you know i don't know people who looked at the world economic forum that you know took place uh, in january and they talked about the great reset of capitalism you know and then when you look at the, the conversations that they're planning in the g7 the conversations they're planning in the convention of biodiversity to the conversations they're planning in, into the cop 26 saying we recognize your everything you're saying about these crises but our solutions are going to be about market driven about the role of what they call multi-stakeholder, which basically means the corporations playing an increasingly big role. And again, I think COVID gives us an example of that, right? You, 
here's a here's something that could have been a people's vaccine under the WHO, ends up being COVAX, ends up corporations dominating, ends up all about goodwill. Rich countries will donate any of their surplus to the poorer countries. So I, I feel like we could win the battle, but lose the war in this in the in this question. And I really think we need to have more conversations collectively, uh, an honest conversation about where we are at this very very critical uh, uh, juncture in that. Um, I said, let me I... stop you here. Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm sorry to stop you here and you will still have the word a bit later, but let's also give uh, a bit the chance to some of the participants. Sorry. And I mean, no, I think that was really great. I think you put some uh, really interesting or yeah, some bigger challenges in there, right? So you talked uh, specifically about that uh, some of the um, uh, new climate justice movements don't have the policy pathways to get there. So maybe we can unpack that a bit. Maybe we can hear from the other speakers or from participants about that a bit. And that uh, some of the mov movements shouldn't make the uh, same mistakes that maybe um, happened before already. And you also talked a bit about um, the role of the state, to, if we think about solutions. So how do we have to look at the state or not? And uh, you also maybe challenged us a bit more on really what do we actually really say concretely if we say no fossil fuels and why we see already some of the solutions that is always, uh, yeah, we see still and there's something lacking. And how you ended also with another challenge is do we actually have enough, did we build up enough sufficient power and where is that lane? So let's maybe try to dig a bit into some of those uh, we we have some time. Also, Lucy, maybe if you wanna, I didn't manage to read your longer input in the chat box. If you wanna talk, do take the floor if you wish to. Otherwise, um, one of us will yeah will repeat a bit what was written in the chat box. So I invite uh, the participants, but also the um, the other speakers. If you still want to respond to uh, to the other speakers, what you heard or had different questions, please do that as well. Would someone like to start? And we can't see all of your hands. So if you want to speak, do put an asterisk, a star into the, into the chat box. Lucy, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry for that big text. I mean, I think someone once said that when you have no time, you send really long emails. And that was probably a bit what just happened here. Um, because I was trying to think and listen at the same time, which didn't work out so well. So I just wanted to quickly ask if there was any advice, like I'm based in Europe, I'm based in Germany. So this come from a very northern perspective, but on how to use the opening basically that Corona has opened to many of us in the global north because economic crisis is here. It's not taking the same shape as 2008, but the question of justice and fairness is much more in the open than it's been for a while. And the question of where money goes is also out in the open. So I'm just wondering if there are things we should keep in mind or ideas how to build our movements around that and how to seize this opportunity because money is a language that due to our bringing in the capitalist society, we speak across all uh, parts of society. And also things to keep in mind to avoid repeating mistakes of the past. That would be really interesting. Thanks a lot, Lucy. There's also a question from Martin, Ola Martin. And the question is uh, around how to face as movement states as a major actor who provides support to corporations and elites specifically in the global south. So that's related to also Assad's uh, question around the state. And um, yeah, as participants, really, you can, you're also free to answer some of the questions, right? So it's not only up to us or the speakers. Anyone would like to come in? Uh, maybe Anne, since it's also quite a long comment, people can take the time to read, but please take the floor. I invite you to speak. <laughs> Okay, very briefly, I actually have to run to another meeting. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I think at that point about the sort of, I guess, the supply chain of materials, I think that's really, you know, it's really important. You know, we kind of think about, yeah, renewables. And I think there was also other speaker, speakers who made that point. Renewables are great, but actually if we if we don't consider the kind of uh, potential displacement of people along the supply chain, uh, as well as the sort of social political structures which have held that, I, um, upheld that, I think that's, that's you know, really uh, important. And then, 
secondly, I'm just doing a little bit of um, sort of uh, some interviews with somebody from Friends of the Earth Ghana, where we're interviewing energy professionals on energy access around perceptions of gender and gender and energy. And actually, one thing that's already coming out of that is like, yay, we can have a policy on gender mainstreaming. That's really great. But actually, how that translates into sort of local governance and into action on the ground, that sort of translation is often missing, it seems. So well, it's early stages. But I have to run. So thank you so much. And see you later. Bye. Thanks a lot, Anne, for uh, joining us. You might miss the answers uh, to some of your input that you gave. Uh, so I will just read out the question uh, of Brian, and then maybe we can hear from some of the speakers if you want to respond to that as well. Brian, you said, how can public sector unions play a role in an international labor movement for just transition, social justice and others? So maybe with that, um, anyone from the speakers wants to jump in? Jaron, you were the first one. We didn't hear from you for a while. Do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. I mean, what I can speak into it, just want to also thank all the other speakers and really appreciate the perspectives that are that are um, brought from TUED, from the Shell, uh, Shell No campaign or Shell Must Go campaign, and from obviously aside also a long time of, of shared struggle. Um, and I think toward the question that was raised about this political moment, um, the conjunction that we're in coming out of the COVID pandemic, I think is an important opening in, in some of the ways at least we're approaching um, the response that's going to happen because we are in a period of, you know, where the questions of, you know, recovery, you know, we had still have so many millions of people who've been, um, you know, fundamentally shifted out of out of their um, economic stability. Um, in our context, there was just a report in December that uh, 140,000 jobs were lost and they were all held by women, predominantly women of color. And so um, how we've been approaching um, the, the question of recovery has been um, looking at the intersections of four struggles. So, so the, the context of the COVID pandemic, the context of the economic crisis, the constant context of the climate crisis, and then also the context of structural racism. And for sure um, in the, you know, North America, the other most transformative impact of 2020 was the massive uprisings in defense of black lives. Um, and, you know, what happened after the police murder of George Floyd um, and Breonna Taylor, and that the question of, um, of not only, um, you know, the, the conditions of black people uh, across the United States, but also the, the fundamental structural dynamics of racism that affect um, everything uh, in our context. Um, and so, I think then we're, what we've been trying to do is move forward a model around, um, you know, things that are along the lines. And I, I know that the, the concept of the Green New Deal is being extrapolated like any other of these terms. They can become concepts up for corporate capture, up for, you know, um, you know, kind of a narrowing of the vision. But I agree very much so with Assad that what we saw with the announcement even of, you know, by AOC and by the movements in 2018 of the Green New Deal, it was fundamentally you know, an expression of if we're going to deal with the climate crisis, we have to deal with the economy as a whole. And that vision of just transition that many impacted peoples, impacted workers, impacted communities have been talking about is, is the kind of political strategy that we're focusing on, um, not only over the next 10 years, but even in the immediate moment, that how do we look at if we're going to be investing in trying to, you know, help re recreate strength and economy, how do we invest in, in the kind of jobs that are care jobs, that are, you know, the kind of, you know, teaching, you know, nursing, healthcare, the things that have been exposed as a fundamental need, where our energy and resources need to go in the economy that we're going to build, as well as in questions of renewable and trying to have forward, put forward the whole of the model of, of that, this kind of vision of community control. Um, so I really agree that the more that we have the clarity of our demands ready to go, that we have, you know, whether it's policy interventions tied with, you know, movement pressure, um, tied with, you know, pr the pressure that comes from impacted peoples leading and fighting for, you know, to, to impact their own conditions, I think is the strategy that we're moving right now. And I do think it, it is, a, it, it needs to be globally connected. And the last thing I want to say, because I know we're going to come back to this, um, is that we are uh, needing to confront, I know that it's not the 
best term, but the one that our movements use so much, we do need to confront very actively the false solutions in this moment, because uh, we're really seeing that as the central question coming into to COP26. Um, everywhere in North America right now, the number one term that's being used is net zero, net zero emissions, net zero this, it's a, it's a, a you know, um, there's a really important report that we're a part of with Friends of the Earth International called Chasing Carbon Unicorns. It's going to be released, I think, this week. I really hope to align with you all around that. But that is where we're seeing um, the threat in this time is that uh, we have the far right, the, you know, the climate deniers out there, but we also have the corporate capture of the climate process. And I think th where uh, that mechanisms are able to then um, claim progress um, while actually furthering uh, markets, offsets, geoengineering, what they're calling nature-based solutions. I think as long as those mechanisms are there to give cover to these transnational energy corporations, then we, we are in a very difficult situation to advance the kind of fundamental change we need. Thanks a lot, Joan, for that. That's really, uh, that's really useful to uh, hear from you. Uh, Pala, you go first, and then I still invite uh, the other speakers to add something to the questions and comments that are coming. And then in yeah, about maybe two, three minutes, we will still want to ask you uh, one concrete question regarding the COP. Pala, you go ahead. You might want to unmute you, otherwise we might kind okay. of... Okay, yeah, I, I'm Pelle from NOAA, France of Earth, Denmark. Um, I want to start with uh, a comment or, uh, to assets. Uh, some of your first remarks about the framing that we managed uh, in the movement largely to, to change uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and I think that's, that's very uh, important, of course. Uh, uh, but also, I think it is important to, it, it's also connects to what Jaren just said about false solutions, which we have been fighting all along. And, and that, that uh, uh, the, the, the energy, the energy uh, movement in the North and Denmark, at least, uh, has been largely a technical uh, or technological uh, uh, discourse. It ha has been a, a question of how to how to 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 um, um, substitute the fossil fuel uh, uh, supply uh, with some renewable uh, sort of uh, energy, and 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 not not tackling the the the. the the size of the demand and 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 all the all the underlying economical and social uh, forces that are running the whole show. And uh, uh, when we looked at uh, at extractivism that uh, some of you had talked about, you can see there. Are, I, I mean, in in Denmark, the situation with the climate law last year was mainly: do we want 700,000 electric cars by 2030, or is it necessary with 1 million? And it's completely ridiculous discussion because it doesn't address where do all the components come from, uh, the lithium and, and all the other metals, etc. So, uh, way back in like 12 years ago, uh, we, we started um, mm, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, we lined up with, with uh, the, the eco equities and, and uh, greenhouse development rights framework, which was one way of, of addressing the, the, the social issue, uh, uh, the justice issue uh, uh, by, by turning the whole world into a giant spreadsheet and calculating uh, everything in a fair manner. And, and if you do it this way and look at the greenhouse gas budgets, then you cannot, uh, you cannot help uh, addressing the, the demand side because the, there's no way that we can reach uh, the, the targets in time 
uh, unless we, we redu reduce demands among the rich people of the world. And TTR was, was a, a way of looking at that. Another, if I may, uh, one, one blind spot for many years has been the, the, the thing about biomass, which has been looked upon as, as, a, as a renewable energy. And, and we can see that it is absolutely not a renewable energy. It is not, it is being burned. We burn the, the force of the world at a speed that uh, we cannot uh, uh, regenerate the, the, the same forests. And, and when we look at the, 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 the bottom of the, the, the Paris Agreement is the idea of BECs, of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. Uh, if, if that should be the, the solution, we would have to burn more or less half of the, wo the world uh, in order to, to supply energy that way. So I think these are some of the, 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 the main things that uh, must be addressed. The, this, you could call it degrowth in the rich countries or among the rich people of the world. And then also the issues of, of extractivism and, 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 uh, and stopping burning the world. Thank you very much, Palem, and really great to see you. Haven't seen you for ages. No, <laughs> so. no, no, I can, I can, I can um, tell when I see Asad, his, your beard has grown, Asad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so before we go more into that, let's still uh, maybe yeah, zoom out a bit and um, let's focus a bit more on kind of the discussions that, that we had. So I would suggest just being aware of the time, uh, maybe just asking Luisa in between, Luisa, if you see anything still in the chat, uh, Luisa from TNI that you would like to, because I couldn't read everything that you would like to highlight, please indicate um, that, yeah, then we can also, that we don't lose things from the chat um, either. But people of course have the chance to read um, also the chat. Um, so there was uh, maybe, I would say Lala and Marisol, you can you have the chance in a moment to also respond to some of the comments or questions that were put in. But let's jump into the last question. Um, there was already one question uh, regarding the COP also in the um, uh, in the chat box, and maybe how hopeful are people for the COP26? How much of an influence are fossil fuel corporation? corporations going to have from un uh, steward and with that maybe i hand over for the last bit also to lavinia and uh, that we can hear still some inputs from the speakers and respond to the comments lavinia thank you susie um yeah so uh, it was nice that um, this question in the chat was already on the cop 26 um and the power of fossil fuel corporations um i uh, also want to highlight this question that nasim um, put. So uh, this question is kind of like, how can we manage the intersection of building power with bringing concrete policy proposals that are fighting commodification and market-based solutions in a context of accelerated decay of liberal democracies and the acceleration of right-wing movements and power globally? So that puts a lot of things together. Um, so in, in light of these two questions from the floor, um, it would be great to hear what we can and should be doing concretely um, towards the COP uh, 26 end of this year, but also really, um, yeah, how we can move forward and, and manage to bring uh, building power together with uh, building concrete policy proposals um, in the next decade. So, so this is a, a big, yeah, a big ask, I can imagine, but um, I'm sure you'll do great. <laughs> so uh, since um, we haven't heard, heard so much uh, from you, um, Lala and Marisol. Let me first uh, get, make space for, for the both of you. Um, Lala, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, there's a lot to respond to. <laughs> These are great questions. Um, so I just took down sort of six points to, to answer to, and I'll do it very briefly. So regarding COP26, um, TUED is uh, organizing a Latin America delegation. It should be noticed, people's perceptions of COP26 are often um, not contradictory, but encompass the contradictions of, of COP26 in the sense of, you know, is that really, oh, sorry. 
Um, is that really where the front line of our struggle is? Isn't that just where the policy work is done? And so I think when we push for these delegations, we have to ensure that as we push for them and build them, that that space is going to be a movement space. It is going to be a trade union space. It is going to be a radical space for transformation and not just a sort of like, you know, whatever it is, um, trip where we dialogue briefly and, you know, discuss our dreams, but ultimately, uh, you know, policymakers <laughs> sort of make the, the calls and, and we're left on the, on the sides. How, so in constructing those delegations, how are we going to guarantee that um, there is a disruption at these, at these conferences uh, from, our, from the movements? Um, so I think in terms of um, the sort of like what is to be done, I think, you know, Tuad's approach to this has been um, that there has to be a sort of multi-pronged approach to all these struggles, right? We are restoring energy democracy as we are reclaiming energy democracy, as we are restructuring energy democracy. And be wary of anyone that says, well, the priority is first this and then this. We have no time. It has to be sort of simultaneously that we fight against privatization as we demand public investment in renewable energy and democratizing of um, the energy decisions that go into renewable energy expansion. Um, I think one thing that I've ex seen um, about in terms of some of the challenges and, and debates that I said mentioned, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, so when it comes to policy work, I think that it's really important to recognize that we can speak from our position of like our, our experiences, our territories, um, our expertise. So, you know, when it comes to sort of the technical questions of the oil sector, it is so useful to have on your side these oil unions that can break down some of those technical questions for you. Um, when we talk about some of the questions of how do we put a feminist lens or um, racial justice demands into these programs. It is so good to have comrades that you know of, that you have built with, to to say, what do you, you know, like let's let's write this together. How do we, you know, put these demands together? And so we have expertise in our experiences and have to trust that and have to know, you know, sort of what who to ask and who to go to and who to build with. But at the same time, we have these blind spots where our comrades are often the most apt people to critique our approaches. And how often are we doing those exchanges where we are going out of our way to ask for critique from comrades, to say, this is the report that we put out, but what do you think? Critique it. I'm listening to you. And really listening, like really being open to um, where the shortcomings are. What am I not seeing? Um, I think there's, it, it's very comfortable, of course, to say, you know, for, for movements to be, to attempt to be all encompassing, to take this, you know, sort of, we have thought everything through and we think that we have included all the possible demands. Um, and that's comfortable because it allows us to say, well, they, you know, they don't consider the a holistic approach to justice, but how beautiful it would be and how more efficient it would be to think that comrades arrived at different conclusions, not because they didn't not because they devalued some lives over others, although sometimes that does happen, but because they came at it from a different perspective and let's critique one another's work and let's make sure that all our demands are, um, are, are sort of uh, build off of one another so that we're really complementing one another's demands. And there's a lot to say, I was gonna get to six points, but there's no way in, in sort of this time. I think I will say one thing because it's specific to the trade union movement. And um, I saw this in Chile where I was talking to a trade union space um, and they were saying, you know, we really just wanted to create our own space within the, the COP framework to discuss as trade unionists, what we have to do, what, how we're going to hold one another accountable, how we're going to construct a progressive trade union movement. We have so many problems. We just need some space to, to like discuss between ourselves. And then I talked to one of the sort of environmental movement activists and they were saying, Ah, oh, it's so annoying that the trade unions just like insist on setting up their own tent, their own space. They think they're special. They don't engage with us. This is the problem with the trade union movement. And like, you know, I was listening to these two perspectives and I was saying they're both valid. Like, 
of course, the trade unionists need to be building with the social movements. But often they know that and they're just actually holding themselves accountable and saying sometimes we need spaces to like really hone down on what our agendas are. So I think and I'm trying to wrap up here, um, you know, it's important for organizations and movements and causes to have their spaces where they sort of vent, where they air things out, where they talk about their internal contradictions, where they hold one another accountable, where they push for internal democracy. So again, sort of the feminist question within the trade union movement, um, among many others. But then it's also important to create those intentional spaces where there's exchange and where there is, um, you know, common agenda building. And there's just so much more to say, but um, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there. And, and I ask that question, right? How often do we reach out to comrades to critique our movement work, to critique our proposals? And are we building long-term infrastructure? Not one webinar, not one conference, not one Congress, but the long-term infrastructure, the think tanks, the public assemblies that are required to really, to really you know, push for a just transition. Thanks, Lana. I think it was very comprehensive and powerful to push us and challenge us forward. Um, Marisol, would you like to give your final thoughts? Yeah, of course. Um, I think I won't be as elaborate as, as Lala, but I think uh, my main concern or projection for uh, the COP26 is really uh, how can we address in the these months that we have left is sort of address the community crisis that we're facing in with our movements. I think uh, most of the grassroots uh, have really been hit by the corona pandemic. Uh, I think uh, coming like speaking as a from the perspective of a organizer who did massive disobedience actions, I think our main tool we have been robbed sort of of the main tool of sort of uh, intercepting into uh, spaces of power to bring out our message and I think um, until this point we are struggling of sort of reinventing like the tools of how yeah how we can build counter power in these contexts and I um, yeah I remain yeah depending on how the pandemic will develop I, I uh, I remain sort of critically and semi hopeful that uh, until the end of the year we will manage uh, uh, to to be stronger and that to have a stronger base in that. So I think no matter what, how, yeah. So I think one important focus of the COP will have to be at least to be able to create these spaces for meaningful interchange and and to plan ahead for the future. Um, because that can still be be done online, um, and yeah, I'm I'm just not so hopeful about really intercepting uh, effectively into the negotiations itself. Uh, but I hope maybe that other creative minds have the ideas on on how to do that. Uh, and maybe as a last thing to close up, like uh, since Asad spoke, uh, what he said really st like stuck to me. The the point about like needing the support. Uh, like the grassroots needing the support to develop like policy advice. I think um, at least with our campaign, we have been in this position with the Shamas for campaign. We've been in this position for two years that uh, sort of we feel that we have the knowledge to, to mobilize on the ground, you know, bring people together around a certain idea, but do not have the time or the capacity nor the knowledge to also invest to create uh, these policies as idea to really establish or like draw the pathways towards a just transition. And that is like a really urgent call to sort of progressive think tanks, <laughs> uh, progressive academics to take up that role and to really work uh, harder on, uh, on research that can complement and inform movement strategies uh, in the future. I think there has to be a much more like empowering each other's role uh, in the upcoming months uh, to really yeah, guarantee that some change will happen. And then um, that's it. <laughs> Marisol, that was great. Um, good to be very concrete uh, also. Um, so um, Asat, uh, it would be great to, to have your final uh, two minutes, let's say, um, what needs to be done um, and what is absolute priority. Please, uh, over to you. 
Sure. Uh, and maybe I can put my COP26 coalition hat on for the COP26. Look, I, I, I won't re, uh, uh, restate what everybody said. It's been a, a hugely challenging year for all of us, for movement building and, you know, for many of us who took the lessons of the last decade and a half, you know, we've set up a coalition that was explicitly climate justice, that was be explicitly platforming the movements of the global south, put into place all of this sort of infrastructure and that, that we would be actually good allies. We would we would do that and we would shape how uh, movements interacted at the COP26, both inside and outside. And of course, everything is thrown out at, uh, into disarray with, with the COVID pandemic. And I just want to just, uh, and so we're still committed to doing that, but I think we've got to, you know, the question about COP26 to me has always been a question about power, right? You, uh, all the ills of the COP26 are always about imbalance of power between us and, and, and the elites and, and the state. And the question is always, how do we build power? So we should not see the COP26 as the end moment, but particularly see, 2021 and 2022 and 23 as critical years where they will lay the foundations of their recovery and you know and and in that this year we should not ignore biden's climate leadership summit we should not ignore the g7 because they are playing three-dimensional chess with us right they're moving pieces in each of these different spaces and we are not aren't always coordinated in the same way to be able to have the most impact across the board and so i think that again is about the ecology of our movement being better coordinated and structured in, in the in the justice justice space i wanted to just give a reflection also maybe from from the uk which i think are some of the dynamics that are, that were all played you know because lucy asked this question about the international you know um uh, and how do we bring that international night i think we should also recognize people are exhausted right from the COVID pandemic, there is an exhaustion. There is huge job losses, not only in the global north, but in the global south. That, that psychologically means as much as people say we want a recovery, they also want to say, let's hold what I've got because the future could be even bleaker from, from me. And so our ability to build social license both has an opportunity, but it also has potential pitfalls in that, that more sort of more nationalistic messages around the recovery have a great have a possibility of a greater agency you know uh, america first uh, build back better uh, european global green new, group, group, european green new deal all of these play to we shall look after ourselves and you know we've all i think all of us on this zoom have always said you know you can't separate the fight about jobs from uh, justice and climate but there is a danger that we end up with jobs and climate and not the justice, right? Not the international dimension. And we can already see that. Look at what global governments in the North are saying. Our coffers are empty. We have no money. The most of the people will be fighting about in, ensuring there's no austerity in the in the northern economies, right? The, the, the international has a, has a, there is a danger. It falls off and becomes secondary to our demands rather than the center part of our demands. So I think there is, that again, is a, this is what we add to the broader conversation of the movements. And, you know, you can see it amongst mainstream NGOs in the UK who say, yeah, okay, you might have done the fair share analysis saying that the UK should be at minus 200 by 2030. That means they're at zero carbon and a trillion that they owe to the global south. But that's just policy. That's not pragmatically possible. So what we're going to call for is net zero at 2045 because that is more policy. And so that, st that pragmatism of this moment also has, has the ability to undermine our demands and we can only shift the dial on that if we are better coordinated and I don't think we're as effectively coordinated in in, in terms of that and and I think there are I mean, and that there there is a, a huge profound change we're trying to make and going back to Brian's question about the public sector unions and again I think we win in the f argument about the commons going from just the commons being about public services being the common to making energy and food is really, really important. And, you know, we have social scientists who are writing incredible research papers that you can provide energy to 10 billion people, but it's not translated to the movements in terms of how are we, how does that benefit us? What is the, how do we use this kind of information? And I think that point about uh, better upward and downward flow between people when they're writing reports so that when we create tools or create things they actually benefit the whole movement rather than us thinking about only in a very narrow 
in a narrow perspective. Sorry, Lavinia. <laughs> Great. Um, it's, uh, it's very necessary to be passionate about these things because uh, they are so acute. Um, and uh, let me just give the final floor to you, Jaren. Um, I, uh, I do want to ask you to keep it short. And in the meantime, it was a very rich discussion. I also want to say that if you want to share anything with this group, you can also share them on the energy democracy list afterwards, um, but please put them in the chat because uh, then, um, yeah, we can uh, wrap up in time. Uh, Jaren, please, you can uh, take the final word. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this important conversation. And, and I know that we're on a process together of building toward, you know, this road to COP26, beyond the, the COP26. I agree with, you know, the COPs themselves are limited in many ways in their form, but they also are so important because it is where our movements are coming together and converging and also where we're moving the question politically around where, where, where can we get uh, the global governments to act in in, in um, the ways that are needed. So I think coming out of COP25, actually, which was, you know, almost two years ago, was incredibly important because of the movements in Chile that were bringing forward the historic massive uprising, can, you know, around the end of neoliberalism, right? Around that like, neoliberalism started in Chile, it's going to end in Chile, and the incredible depth of the, the student movement, the popular movement that, that stayed in the streets, the Plaza de la Dignidad, unbelievable historical transformation, um, and obviously deeply connected to the United States as well, because it was, as, as Assad said, Milton Friedman, and, um, and the Chicago boys who put that ball into motion that we're still battling today. And then I think in Madrid, where we saw the biggest uprising, or, you know, not uprising, not, not uprising, but resistance within the COP of the walkout of the civil society around the question of markets. And I think that, as we're going into COP26, is where we need to stay focused. We need to stay pressuring. We know that the COP process has, has experienced a corporate capture. We know we are facing an incredible well-organized opposition that has had decades to think about how to maintain their interests and protect them. And so I think here, the, the brilliance of our movements do have solutions we can put forward um, and can speak to that. And one of the most baseline we even need to talk about is real zero. We need to talk about actual cuts to emissions at source. And we have the, the, the leg to stand on because we are, we're also bringing forward that what that means for the communities who are directly impacted. You know, and in our case here in Richmond, California, where I live, where we, they've been fighting for years around the Chevron refinery because of the tremendous cancer cluster and uh, asthma impacts and all of those things that we're experiencing, those demands to directly hold Shell accountable, hold Sh Chevron accountable, um, to push in, 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 in the direct ways also are going to be part of what's at stake um, in this COP26. So I'm excited excited to be working with you all. I hope that folks will also check out the movement of people affected by dams and the MAR articulation happening in Americas. And I hope that we can be in, in much stronger um, alignment as we move forward this year. That's great. Thanks, Jaren. Um, and I really want to thank you all uh, for great inputs, uh, especially to the speakers, but very much also to the other participants. Uh, your participation in the chat and verbally was uh, really rich. Um, and um, if you want to stay up to date, um, keep on sharing uh, what we can do together in terms of building a, a climate justice and energy democracy together, uh, do consider subscribing. The email address is in the chat. Um, and the next webinar will only be after summer, so there's a bit of time in between. But you can let us know um, any theme you would like to um, you would like us to focus on for this webinar. And also, if you have a, a story uh, campaigning or building democracy on the ground um, that you would like to um, uh, yeah, popularize, uh, do reach out to Susie or me and, and we can make that happen uh, together. So um, thanks for your extra minutes um, as it's too fast over. And, uh, and it was a yeah, great pleasure to, to see you all. And um, yeah, more power to you to build the counter power we need, right? Um, for the COP26 uh, as the first uh, next milestone. So thanks, everyone. Susie, Thank you, everybody, us. for joining. <laughs> Let's keep on, yeah, continue those discussions. And Bye. I see also now finally the light went up uh, in California. <laughs> so thanks again for joining. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye.